Hi, everyone. Welcome to the November 14th DSI Labs community call, where we're going to be talking all around FAIR data. So in the past, I guess, week and a half, uh, we've had two wonderful calls around FAIR data. The first being from Alessa, one of our node stewards, which was all around what it's like to be a FAIR data or to be a data steward at a university focusing on FAIR. The second being the Future of Science seminar from Eric Schultz, which just happened, I guess, 15 minutes ago. Um, both were wonderful calls, a lot of great information that will continue to come out uh, either on YouTube or Medium, or I think for the Future of Science Foundation or Future of Science seminar, we will have a Spotify podcast afterwards. Um, then beyond that, uh, a couple quick updates just from the DSI Labs team themselves. Uh, we are now back and settled from the entirety of conference life. Things are settling down from fall conference season, so we are getting back to building, which is always exciting. Um, I don't know, Chris, if you have any immediate updates that you want to give, uh, but if not, then we can probably jump into the meat of the call. Yeah, I think we can absolutely jump in. All right. Well, I can go ahead and just give a quick recap of the call with Alessa that happened last week. So for those of y'all who aren't aware, the Node Stewards program is officially getting kicked off. And we have quite a few amazing stewards who are on there with existing industry experience in the world of academic data and metadata. One of them being Alessa. Uh, the node that we've been using as our demo for an extended period of time is actually a piece of her work around um, <clears throat> around the lapis lazuli color blue tint that was used in ancient times. It's a really interesting paper. It's an interesting read. Um, but during that call, she talked to us a lot about the process of being a data steward at a university and some of the challenges that kind of came along with that. Um, a huge part of her conversation and talk was focused on community and some of the difficulties that come along with implementing FAIR data principles in a larger university setting. Uh, if you are someone who is more technically inclined, you have to communicate technical details of FAIR data to someone who is, let's say, a microbiologist, whose focus probably isn't on technical implementation and backend storage. So a, a huge part of that conversation was around how to communicate with researchers around the importance of FAIR data. Um, there were a lot of other points raised in that call. So for anyone who was there, please feel to, free to chime in with more information. I'll go ahead and give a quick pause in case anyone wants to. And silence is golden. So with that, uh, Chris or Carla or Philip, do one of the three of you want to give a quick summary of the most recent Future of Science seminar that just happened? Yeah, definitely. So we just had Eric Schultz come on. Uh, he's uh, from the Go Fair Foundation, and he was actually one of the original co-authors of the Fair Guiding Principles. And so he basically walked us through the history of the Fair Principles, why we need them, and then painted a picture of a beautiful future where all data is fair. And the idea is that you will be able to query basically all of the research data that's ever been collected and published in a private way and answer all the questions that you might have about any research hypotheses, any of the data that's publicly available. Yeah, it was so I mean, it was a, a really interesting seminar and it ties into quite a number of efforts we've been pursuing at uh, DSI Labs and also with DSI Foundation regarding uh, understanding and embedding ourselves and essentially creating a, a good mental model of how to maximize the, the value that the infrastructure we're building can bring uh, with regards to interoperability uh, defined in the broad sense. The, the FAIR data principles um, have been a way to essentially improve interoperability of digital objects and published resources, be it data sets, code, and other types of uh, digital resources. And that, that question of interoperability has always been at the center and a, a very important guiding principles in the way we've been thinking about things. Um, 
Because ultimately what we want to build, we want to be in a world where it's easier to reuse digital artifacts, it's easier to rebuild on the works of other, it's easier to reuse their code, their data, their computational workflow, it's easier to credit. Um, essentially, if we can reduce the pain of reusing digital resources by just a couple of percentage points, we can create tremendous gains in the pace of knowledge production. So it's an incredibly point. It's an incredible point of leverage, essentially, for developing any type of new uh, uh, novel infrastructure for uh, digital digital object publishing. Um, so what have we done? If we take a step back a little bit and try to to understand a broader context. Um, so one of the first thing we've done is we've we've been so I've been I was familiar I've heard about fair principles for a bit uh, when we started these labs it's one of the things I've looked at I had a deep dive into into these fair principle and thought about how we could create uh, uh, an infrastructure which would be uh, fair by design right which would really uh, um, facilitate the implementation of the fair principles um, but at the same time. It's also very important to stress that it's not like a technical guidebook that you can just follow and check boxes and be at the end of the day, hey, okay, it's fair by design. No, because a lot of these fair principles um, are still subject to definitions, right? They're, they're still subject to community refinement. They're subject to, to discussion among working groups. There's an enormous amount of activity around those. And lately, I would say, you know, in the past one or two years, there's this new concept uh, that has emerged, which is actually the combination of both fair data and digital objects, right? So digital object is this idea that came in from Bob Kahn, one of uh, the creator of TCP IP and, and other internet luminaries. It was about, you know, creating a more interoperable web. Uh, we also had before that, I think in the same intellectual lineage, we had semantic web, right? So this is Tim Berner-Lee, Web 3.0, uh, and also very uh, important uh, uh, milestone in development of the internet. Um, and so all of these currents, they, they, they all converge on this idea of improving interoperability and improving machine readability. So this is really the, 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 the guiding principle uh, underlying all of this. Now, if you take the digital object framework um, and the FAIR principles, they've been a synth there's been a synthesis um, quite recently that's, that's underway. It's this idea of FAIR digital object. All right, so the fair digital object is this idea that we combine um, the digital object framework and the, the, the findable, accessible, reusable, interoperable. And so, so we've been at the conference in Leiden, um, which was a, quite a fantastic conference organized by uh, the, the GoFair Foundation, as well as other stakeholders in the system, where people are essentially thinking about a new hourglass model, right? And, and I think we've seen that in the fair, uh, in the seminar we've just had today. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the hourglass model, it's essentially the model of interoperability, right? It is why the internet works. At the middle, you know, you have the packet. Uh, at the middle of IPFS, uh, for example, the IPFS stack, you have, you know, content address storage. So all of these systems um, that uh, essentially allow for broad scale networking, they, they rely on a, a, a unit that is highly interoperable at the middle. And uh, Right now, a lot of the focus for this group, Fair Digital Objects, and also in the, in the thinking we're doing is, what is this object that's situated at the middle of the hourglass? And what form does it take? And what is the technological uh, underpinnings that support this object, right? And so that, that's, a, that's a major question. Uh, that there's, there's working groups from the FDO people on this, and there's different uh, efforts underway to try and really define what this could look, look like. Um, and there's different models to go about it. One of the things that, we've, that, that sets us apart and that is uh, quite unique about what we're doing with regards to this broader debate about fair digital objects and fair principles is that um, it's always been at the heart of our technology stack to to depend and rely on uh, so-called content address storage, right? So that's you know the technology underpinning IPFS, interplanetary file system, and the reason why there's two reasons why this is a huge huge win for uh, uh, as a potential solution to find that uh, elusive middle unit in the hourglass model. The first is that. It is not. It essentially provides uh, persistent identifiers out of the box using hash functions. That's very powerful. Um, these persistent identifiers have the property that they 
they don't they're not subject to link route right there because they're pointing to what the object is and not where it's located which is uh, one of the um, let's say uh, uh, limitations of the current architecture of the internet today as we know it and um, on top of providing that that uh, um, pr um, preservation against against content drift, it, it also allows a highly interoperable type of data structure, which is called IPLD, uh, uh, to essentially, uh, um, which is developer friendly, right? So that we can think about it, uh, think about you know at least the version of IPLD that we're we're, we're using is <clears throat> uh, a JSON uh, um, version of IPLD, and essentially the idea is that we have this format that came from the semantic web movement, which is called JSON-LD, and we can actually have uh, uh, some form of, of compatibility between JSON-LD and IPLD to essentially create these research objects and create these units of metadata that link, that point to data, that have a persistent, well, I would even say permanent identifier linked to them, you know, certain methods and, and, and certain types and certain metadata definitions associated with them that allows us to essentially re-envision, you know, how these research objects can be stored as rather than having these separate entities stored across silos that are not interoperable. Well, now you have a, a very rational data model that allows you to link all of these components in a way that uh, um, it both protects against content drift, provides persistent identifier at arbitrary levels of granularity. And I think that's that's really important um, because the question is, of course, and I think there was a lot of debate during the FDO conference, and it was actually quite a heated debate in the room I was in. It's like, well, what is the scale of the fair digital object? Is it a single file? Is it the collection of file? Is it the collection of a collection of file, right? Is it is it essentially you know linked data structure? What is the what is the atomic unit here, right? And you, when you think about persistent identifiers, you, you usually run into a problem, which is well, and, and people in, during that conference was was quite funny. They were saying, well, we're obviously not going to mint a billion persistent identifier for a single object, right? I mean, you could think like the extreme degenerate case is like you know every sequence of byte that's encoding some information has a PID to it, right? Which of course is not very useful, but it's a, a toy example to, to illustrate what the generate case would be. Um, and essentially with IPFS, what we can do is that we can have every single file, every single data file, every single uh, uh, digital uh, um, object in a research object have its own PID and have that to be protected against content drift. So yeah, so to, to make a, a long story quite short, um, what we're really interested in is essentially creating an infrastructure that is fair by design and that relies on technologies from the decentralized web movement and to prove that these technologies have a tremendous uh, um, uh, value proposition in creating better solutions for that middle point of the hourglass model. And with that, I'm happy to, you know, kickstart a conversation, take questions and, uh, or, you know, go on and, and, and tell more things. I mean, Chris, I would be, I guess, very interested to hear a little bit more about the hourglass itself. So one of the things that was kind of mentioned in the conversation with Eric was the red and blue aspects of the FAIR principles and how some things are more technologically driven and some things are more community driven. This is something that I've heard you bring up a couple times throughout the course of different calls, but I'm interested to kind of maybe learn a little bit more about that and how you see those aspects fitting into this hourglass structure that was presented at the Future of Science seminar. Yeah, that's a really good question. Let me just drop this image in the chat. This is about, this is IPFS. I just want to drop this here. Um, it's a good, so yeah, exactly. So this is an hourglass model. It's just for people that are not familiar with these hourglass models. This is the hourglass model of um, the, the protocol lab, decentralized web. I will just also drop the hourglass model for the TCP IP. I think these are, Good starting point. Um, here we have one. It's arguably a lousy one, but the the principles are the same. Right? It's all about at the end interoperability. So yeah, so the the heart of the question is what is going to be the central um, unit 
of the FDO, fair digital object. And that is something which is currently being worked on. Um, so back to your question, Eric. Yes, there are two parts. There's the red and the blue. The red part is what we can, let's say, you know, automatically guarantee with technology. Things like having persistent identifiers, having metadata that is preserved independently from the data, having, you know, these, these types of prerequisite for fair data are parts that can be provided and, ver and, and verifiably uh, proven that they are provided by technologies. And for technologists like us, this is the easy part. It's also, it's, it's I mean, it's easy, uh, yes and no. I mean, we can do it, but it's something we, we have full control over. The part where we don't have control is the blue part. That's the community-driven norms. And that's a little bit more tricky because ideally you want a system where, let's say, a, um, a researcher or scientist has a, you know, I don't know, a data preservation plan and they have to keep their data for X years and they have to make it fair. Ideally, you want them to go through a workflow where at the end of the day they get a receipt that says, yep, your data is fair. You know, you've met your obligations, you are compliant, you have, or you have gone beyond the call of duty, and, uh, and, and, and that's that. Unfortunately, that's not really possible, because there's a whole part about the fair data principle, the so-called blue parts, which depend on community definitions and community norms. For instance, that communities have controlled vocabularies to describe things that they measure. I'll give you a simple example, you might have um, let's say we take uh, uh, COVID-19, you might have a certain variable, an outcome variable that's measured, you know, uh, CFD, case fatality ratios, or, or CFR, sorry, or, or other types of outcome variables. And you might have different scientists, different groups, different labs that talk about these outcome measures differently. And now they have, you know, you can't really combine data sets, you can't really... Uh, um, you know, have that level of composable science that you'd want to have because they use different languages, they use different norms, they use different uh, ways of transforming a dependent variable in a ways that just doesn't really make it compatible, right? So that's an example where you need a community norm, you need, hey guys, let's come together, let's form a working group, let's all agree to call, you know, a cat a cat and, and to essentially do what's called, you know, define an ontology or a controlled vocabulary for our work such that whatever research output that we produce, we can easily reuse them between our labs, right? And, and that's, that has, you know, would have uh, enormous, enormous value in accelerating the pace of knowledge production. But that doesn't happen very often. And it doesn't really happen, you know, consistently across communities. There are some communities that are much more advanced in this, and typically, you know, biomedical community, epidemiological communities. Those those communities have uh, um, been put quite a w lot of work into this. Other communities, much less. And ultimately, for some communities, not relevant at all, right? I think it's also important to 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 to, to explain that. Um, and so here. That part is difficult because let's say, you know, you upload your manuscript, you upload your data and it's like, hey, please fill in, you know, a, a link to the PID of the ontology that describes, you know, the columns in your data set. And, you know, for some people, they'll be like, oh, yeah, of course, I'm from the epidemi epidemiological community. I have this site, you know, I have a permalink. I can like pass this permalink. I have here all of my outcome and, and, and uh, measured variables are described according to these controlled vocabulary, these terms. And that's that. But for other communities and other scientists and, other, and maybe you know uh, um, various fields, it'll, it'll be it'll be essentially a, a big question mark. It's like, what the hell is this? You know, this is not something we're accustomed to. We don't have community guidelines. We don't have you know we don't have the same level of uptake of the fair principles as these other communities. And therefore, you know, any system that is there to let's say you know measure the fairness of published research output. So Eric uh, was talking during the seminar that there's a bunch of well, there's a number of providers that automatically crawl these research output, come up with a score uh, about the fair fairness of the data, and then you know tr you know has various systems in place to either you know inform university stakeholders, uh, um, funders you know of the fairness, researchers themselves. But there's not a high level of um, inter-rating uh, agreement. And that's a problem, of course, because inter-rating agreement is, is, is extremely important. And I surmise that the reason why there's not a lot of uh, inter-rater agreement uh, is because you know, they, they're defining and implementing, especially the blue parts, differently. 
which leads to 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 a large degrees of discrepancies between these these uh, uh, ratings. But I could be, you know, I could I, I, here. I, this is a, a speculative. It could also be that they have different differences in the way they define the the technological parts, the red parts as well. And uh, to add insult to injury, um, how do you how do you essentially ascertain that indeed these uh, control vocabularies and 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 uh, ontologies are actually accurate? Right? How do you ascertain that it is, let's say, the community consensus around how this should be described? Well, now you 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 know you you start needing to introduce humans in the loop, and as soon as you introduce humans, you know, data stewards specifically, then uh, that creates uh, 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 a lot of um, you know it, it's not very efficient as a process. Ideally, you'd want the technology to be able to. Uh, verify this uh, as accurately as possible and as precisely as possible, which, uh, given the, the the room for for the blue principle uh, um, in terms of interpretations, in terms of what's correct, what's not, uh, you you need a domain expert to be able to tell you yes, these these metadata have been properly defined according to the the, um, the agreed upon you know the consensus. Uh, uh, on the ontology that we have in our community, so that's a challenge for us in general. And this actually ties in pretty well to the call that we have with Alessa around being a node stu steward and some of the work that she's had to do with regards to community itself. So one of the things that was mentioned in that call was kind of the challenge of being a data steward and having to work with different communities where realistically you might have two data stewards over the course of a university with 1,500 different researchers. So it's, it's not like a data steward themselves can make a specific piece of research fair. Rather, it's about setting guidelines and trying to build up community norms for communities to go about being fair data stewards or, I guess, fair compliant themselves. So that was a, a really interesting point, and it's kind of fun to see how these two different calls interact along those lines. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think it's there's there's definitely a major difference in, in you know how universities define data stewards and how we define node stewards. I mean, these are uh, um, quite quite different things. Uh, for universities, essentially, hey, we have a bunch of researchers producing research outputs, and we need these research outputs to be interoperable and reusable, and that's important. And uh, what's going to happen is there's going to be a lot of work that has to be done on the policy side, on the communication side, on like leading the researchers to the right types of repositories. You know, helping them. Uh, understand, you know, the, the optimal workflows to make their data fairs and, and all of that, right? So there's more like much more of a communication slash policy uh, um, uh, effort that that needs to happen there for, for, for this to become a reality. In our case, it's quite different, right? It's all about finding, you know, extraordinary research objects out there or, you know, uh, scientific discoveries, putting them together in exemplary ways, making these, creating like these interactive, uh, um, uh, beautiful discoveries that people can can uh, experience that, you know, that that have this rich level of uh, connectivity with provenance, such as the data, such as the code. Essentially, it's all about, you know, nodes towards in, 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 in our context, they're all about, you know, building applications out of research, right? So they take, you know, I, I like to say that a research paper is just a front end, and I think that's a that's that's a, a really good way to see it. And that in the back end, there's a database, there's a computational workflow, there might be, you know, some other types of resources that are extremely valuable to understand the broader context of that resource. And the role of a, of a, of a node steward there is to find, like, really worthwhile research and just put it all together and create these these, you know, essentially enriched publication that have high degrees of interoperability. And that also happen, you know, to have fair data, to be essentially int highly interoperable. But I think it's also very important to, 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 to say that we're, we're, we're advancing in uncharted territories in what we're doing here. Um, there are some functionalities that, that we're planning that go far beyond fair data principles like typically this idea of composable signs, right? This idea that, hey, we can actually pull code from a research node into an other node, right? And have automated credit systems. We can pull functions from one node to another. We can, we can you know, expose APIs, run them on Bacala on decentralized compute from one node and like feed those results into an other node, which would then, you know, uh, uh, essentially be fed into the container to like produce even no, new, newer knowledge, new results, new types of outputs. So those, those types of things, they are 100% about interoperability. 
uh, but they're they're let's say they really they're they're in line with the spirit of the fair principles, but they kind of go beyond that in the sense that it's you know applied with a very heavy emphasis on the computational aspects of these research objects, right? And and much less about you know uh, um, harmonizing tabular data or 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 having uh, uh, um, this level of you know community ontologies, right? So it's really about you know reusing these these computational workflows, these containers, these uh, uh, APIs that can be defined, externalized in a way that creates this this these tremendous opportunities for 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 composable science. And I think that's an incredibly interesting ground for experimentation there because we can start doing things that you know are, are uh, um, really go above and beyond uh, uh, the things we've seen in terms of, of uh, uh, reusability and interoperability of digital artifacts. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I also, I, I keep being struck by how many of the technological problems of the FAIR guiding principles our infrastructure actually addresses, right? So the, the fact that we build a system that is built on content addressing uh, really completely solves the problem of these globally unique persistent identifiers, right? So the, they're one of the major technological problems that uh, that the FAIR guiding principles try to address. And they're like inherently solved by, by using uh, content addressing, which is really, really cool. And also this idea of the research object, the way that, that we're defining it, uh, it also solves a lot of the technological problems and opens up scope for going beyond uh, what the current FAIR principles um, sort of dictate or prescribe, which I find really fascinating. Yeah, me too. I'm really excited about that. So. So yeah, I mean, uh, you know, just just to say, you know, node stewards are going to be involving in uncharted territories, and and you know, do magic, right? Do cool things, and 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 show like really interesting examples of composable science, and essentially build with us in a way that we will, you know, improve this infrastructure to create even more composable, more interoperable research, which is something that I'm personally extremely excited about. Um, I could almost see it, you know, we're, we're kind of like, you know, trailblazing uh, what could be, you know, the most interoperable, reusable and composable forms of science. And I think that's a really excited, exciting things for us to be doing. And like Philip said, you know, the fact that we're all based on, you know, content addressing is, is, a, is a tremendous superpower. Uh, and there's we have things in the work that take this to the next level. So, you know, for example, creating uh, um, VS Code extensions to be compatible with content address storage, using, you know, using uh, leveraging Bacalao for uh, computing APIs, you know, stable diffusion, these types of, of models, but much, much more uh, that we can do with that. And so once you start, you start layering all of the possibilities that that we have, that all of the affordances that we're creating, we want to build essentially a giant playground, right? A playground where people can experiment with much more, uh, 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 much higher level of composability and research, and ultimately the goal out of this, right? This this node steward program is it's not really just you know getting numbers in. I think that's that's valuable, but that's really not the the the, the prime goal. The prime goal is is really you know ask yourself the question: What can be done that could never be done before, and and how can we you know how can we provide a publication experience to scientists? That not only goes far beyond what traditional publishers do, um, but provides a tremendous benefit in terms of accelerating collaboration between scientists and accelerating reusability of digital artifacts. Yeah, exactly. I had a follow up question related to this because, like, you were talking about the essentially the AIR of fair but then i was at this conference the other weekend and we were talking a lot about findability and how like knowledge graphs are trying to create this sense of connection between science and all of these things so i was wondering if there was like any additional insight you had into that findability aspect especially as we were thinking about like the way we currently find data is by looking for essentially an article that has data but the way that like sometimes you don't want to ask the same question as the article but we only have this method of exploring and discovering data through the questions that are already being asked of it instead of the questions that could be asked of it. So I wonder if you have any additional thoughts on that. Yeah, so, so my, my additional thoughts on that essentially is, is 
this and this is a broader thought around all the blue areas in the fair principles there's a part of me uh, that says that large language models and breakthroughs in AI will solve for the blue parts. And that could be a tremendous unlock. You could think of a large language yeah. model that does automatic annotation, like annotation in the semantic web sense, right? Not uh, so, so essentially, you know, it takes that annotates data that creates this metadata, right? That's the annotation. In a way, it's just like generating, you know, keywords, you know, all sorts of terms, all sorts of things, you know, in a way that makes, you know, a queries on that data become much more efficient, much more rich, you know, that allows you to really narrow down and find uh, domain cross domain applications, just like you say, right, that like allows you to discover data and repurpose data outside of the way it's defined in an article, right, in a very rich way. I think a good place to start looking at what's happening there is you look at the guys at elicit.org, uh, Elicit AI. They're essentially leveraging, you know, GPT-3's API, I believe, and they're doing that in a way that they're, they're, they have like, you know, they're, they're coming up and experimenting with all sorts of cool features every week, every month. And some of these features are like, hey, let's let's harmonize dependent variable, like the how they're called, right? And you can just kind of look for dependent variables and, and do searches on that. And it'll come up with all sorts of articles which don't necessarily label that dependent variable in the exact same way as you queried it. But because you had a language model in between, it has essentially done a, a translation, right? So when you think of that ability to translate uh, um, um, these, 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 uh, uh, well, let's say the content, right, of these, these, these article in a way that makes them more interoperable, you've essentially had, you know, you've essentially just had an encounter with a process that automatically verifies, you know, research data to some extent. I think that's really, really fascinating. So there's a tremendous uh, opportunity for AI application when it comes to uh, uh, annotating uh, uh, research outputs to make it more uh, findable and interoperable. Yeah, this is this is really fascinating. So we, we had several discussions about this idea of of using artificial intelligence or or language models uh, in this context to create metadata, and it uh, at the Leiden conference, and it seemed to be pretty controversial. So there there are a lot of people that that seemed pretty skeptical towards this idea that that you can have. Um, basically, an algorithm that uh, helps to generate these these metadata, and that this algorithm would actually be at least as good as uh, as human input. But I do think that it's definitely worth starting to play around with this, and I'm pretty sure that we can make quite a lot of progress with this uh, as more data is coming in and uh, we have enough data available to really train meaningful models. Yeah, I mean, it really, really ties into this general index effort that we've yeah. been having since a while, right? So I think that's yeah. like the perfect place to 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 start uh, thinking about that. And um, yeah, I mean, I think it's also very different, you know, to make data that's human readable versus machine readable. I think now in the in the sense, you know, when we think about defining fair fair meta, meta, metadata, you know, we do it with controlled vocabularies, keywords, all these things. But at the end, these are also, you know fairly human readable data, right? Like uh, uh, terms from schema.org, all of those things. Like what would purely machine readable data look like? It could be very different, right? You could have, a, you know, a ton of data associated with it, which is absolutely unreadable for humans. But guess what? When you plug, you know, another model that, you know, does, you know, search, it's actually ideally suited for that other model, right? So like uh, uh, the optimal type of machine readable data is probably very, very far away from the optimal type of human readable data. Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, also this idea of using language models um, could ultimately help to make the metadata that is available uh, more complete, right? So the I see also the, the machines there as an assistant to the humans in terms of like helping humans to not waste time with with creating metadata that is pretty obvious right so there 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 could be algorithms that just make suggestions to the uh, to the authors and then basically gives them some control about which suggestions they actually accept when they create their research objects yeah no no um that that there's there's so many interesting applications here um you know just from a 
from from the simple down to earth UX point of view, all the way up to you know, let's build a better scientific record that's more interoperable. So there, there's there's plentiful opportunities here, and I'm I'm personally very optimistic about that. Chris, this is fantastic, and it's it's exciting to listen to. Um, we really are trying to take a step beyond just what the FAIR principles ask, and especially with a lot of the automated metadata tagging on nodes, there's a lot you can do to simplify the workflow of any researcher. Um, so wanted to quickly open it up to anyone else on the call who has a question around FAIR data and the way that DSI Labs is working to help implement FAIR data principles. but not hearing anything else. Uh, I'll go ahead and just ask a couple questions of my own. Um, to what extent do you think that we will still need humans in the mix for a lot of this metadata creation? And how long do you think that that stays along for? I mean, personally, I'm fairly bullish on a lot of the AI models and at least for some of the simple keyword tagging or descriptions, things that they can do. But for example, something like trying to automatically identify the license type of a piece of paper, you're probably still going to need a human in the loop there. So to what extent, I guess, do you think that we'll still need this kind of centaur model? Yeah, I mean, I think I think a lot of that is going to be, you know, the um, centaur, so-called so centaur model where, there, you know, the AI provides outputs, input suggestions and the human is there to verify that it actually makes sense. Because there's, you know, there's all sorts of uh, um, errors that can happen around the, or let's put it this way. There's a long road to be traveled before you know AIs and 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 these these types of predictive models are sufficiently error free that yeah. we can completely eliminate the human in the loop. Totally. But yeah. at the end of the day, it's not. There's a whole path of value that happens before you eliminate the human in the loop, right? In which you use you essentially use the AI to turbocharge the productivity of the human. And I think we can see this across, you know, now a range of AI applications that are in production, you know, going from Tesla autopilots down to uh, to GitHub uh, uh, Copilot and all of these things, right? So it's all about it's always a human in the loop. And the human just has his work simplified for him and re remains, you know, in control of correcting, editing, improving, and ultimately deciding when everything is ready to be um, publicly committed. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Um, I think one of the challenges we'll have with the generalizability of this um, artificial intelligence approach to generating metadata is uh, the community specificity of, of metadata, right? So I can, I can imagine scenarios where you have relatively small research communities um, that have to find certain ontologies or, or vocabularies um, that they think is, is optimal for them, which a machine may not be able to learn or to identify for the simple reason that either it hasn't been trained on that specific subset of the literature or the literature is just too small, right? Yeah, I mean, ultimately what matters is that Whatever is produced serves the community on a, at a consumption level. So I think it's all, then it's really the question about what is the 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 way the scientific community consumes new content from that community. I think that's really the question, right? And how you can enhance that. Um, you know, a lot of people just sign up for updates on archive or just look at Twitter and like follow a number of people, and they have like these kind of curated lists, or you know, they'll just look at journals and, and and things that come out there and they have kind of a you know kind of kind of a system to keep tabs on like advances in their field and that's what happens and i guess the question at the end of the day is ultimately is like well all of this is is, is great but if it doesn't have an impact on consumption and ultimately on reusability of artifacts then it's not really useful right because ultimately what matters is how content is consumed by communities and how communities uh, reuse each other's uh, uh, research artifacts. So another question that I have surrounding this is, you know, as we're thinking about DSI nodes themselves, 
Part of it is the fact that you have an aggregation of components across the span of a, a research, I guess the life cycle of a piece of knowledge. Um, but another aspect that's kind of being thought about is some of the attributes, some of the validation services, the concept of versioning histories, and just the, the complete scope of what a digital object can be. So how do you view the concept of FAIR as it stands now across a singular paper versus how FAIR could potentially change with a fully integrated digital object that's more than just the component pieces of knowledge? So the, the way I think about it is that, so an FDO is the atomic unit, right? It's like, there, there's, there's a schema. I'm just going to drop this in the chat as well. It's, it's good to, to see it. Right, that's the atomic unit of an FDO, right? So you have an identifier that's wrapping service interfaces, that's wrapping metadata, that's wrapping you know some arbitrary byte stream that's you know some data of some form. And data, I think here you know we should is data broadly broadly defined. So like a PDF is data, right? A, a link to a video is data. So so these so data should not be just conflated with research data. I think that's very important just to understand data very very broadly defined. So you can think of a research node as a collection of interconnected FDOs, right? So essentially you have these atomic units that are linked at a higher level by an IPLD data structure, which is what you have at the center of the uh, hourglass model and the IPFS uh, decentralized web model, right? So that's how you'd think about it, right? So you have at the, you essentially have a, a, a Merkle DAG at which, you know, the lower lowest units on that DAG are these FDOs and they're aggregated in that IPLD data model. And the net effect of that is that you can essentially address any FDO or any digital object uh, from that higher order structure uh, uh, using you know, the, something that is very resembling a simple file path, which, is, which essentially forms a single decentralized permanent identifier that allows you to interact with all of the services, inter, all of the service interfaces uh, um, of all these uh, research artifacts. Is that is that that clear, uh, or or should I expand on this a bit? Um, yeah, no, I think it's clear, uh, and it's it's helpful to see um, as we kind of think about other components being added to a digital object outside of just code, data, and a PDF, it's definitely interesting to see how these can be linked together. So thank you. Yeah, ideally we want this to be, you know, to be able to swallow any type of, um, of digital object, which it can. But, you know, there's again a difference between uh, being able to, to, to upload all of this and being able to render all of this in the browser, right? So like the, the whole, you know, uh, application interface part is, is, uh, is a tricky part. Um, but yeah, essentially, you know, research nodes are collections of FDOs that are linked in an IPLD data model. Awesome, that's helpful. So does anyone else on the call have questions that they'd like to ask? All right, well, I'm going to assume silence is golden here. Chris, do you have any closing thoughts on the call? We're getting towards the end of the call today. Uh, no, all good. Great, great. Really enjoyed the DSI Foundation seminar today. And uh, I think we're going to be working on, on uh, making sure we don't run too late on our on our Monday calls when we have these uh, foundation events. Uh, but I really <laughs> <like> the, <laughs> I, I do like the structure of like discussing these calls uh, during the uh, more more relaxed community calls later on. I think that's a that's a good structure. Yeah, I'm, I'm a fan. This was actually really fun because then some of the questions that I may or may not ask to Eric as he's going through his you know, entire 45 minute presentation, I can kind of bring up here, which may be a little bit more DSI Labs focused. But yeah, I'm a huge fan of this structure. All, all right. right, great, great catching up with all of you. Have a great, great evening. Take care okay. everyone. Thanks, everyone.